The following program is sponsored by CBN. Today, a family secret. All Daddy said to me was, that's what they say. That rewrote the history books. We have to be honest about our complicated history, and it's very painful. One woman's quest to find the truth. I found not just the history, but I found my family. At the home of America's third president. The guy says, well, your dignitaries, your family. Today on The 700 Club. Welcome to the 700 Club, and thanks so much for joining us. Overdose deaths and millions of relapses. COVID stimulus checks may have contributed to a surge in drug use, especially fentanyl. And the source of the fentanyl flooding into the United States? Well, it's China. Some say this constitutes an act of war as it's destroying America from within. Chuck Holton investigates this crisis in one of the hardest hit areas, Appalachia. 2020 saw a record 92,000 drug overdoses across the United States. And while final 2021 numbers have yet to be released, the total looks to be higher still. The crisis is being driven by the ultra potent drug fentanyl. Fentanyl is the most powerful painkiller that's on the market today. And it has a very, very hard effect on the user. It's 100 times more potent than morphine. Only two milligrams of fentanyl can be lethal. In 2021, U.S. Customs and Border Protection seized more than 11,000 pounds of fentanyl in the United States, enough to kill more than two and a half billion people. Distributors are lacing it with less potent drugs like marijuana, meth, and heroin, often without the knowledge of the user. It's not just deaths from fentanyl. Um, it's deaths increasingly fentanyl mixed with methamphetamines and with cocaine. We are finding in our drug screening um, almost every methamphetamine positive also has a fentanyl positive. Once that first high occurs, nothing after that compares. West Virginia saw a 40% increase in the number of overdose deaths just in 2020 alone, and fentanyl played an increasing part in those 1,200 deaths. But if you talk to experts here in West Virginia, they'll tell you that it's also the U.S. government's response to the pandemic that's to blame. Unfortunately, the stimulus monies that were distributed throughout the country as a way to address lost income attributed greatly to overdose deaths and to overdose near deaths and millions of relapses. We've seen a significant uptick, uptick in clients in the recent months. This former addict agrees. I got that big chunk of money. Well, that big chunk of money was gone within days. Sitting at home, being bored, having nothing else to do, already being an addict, you know, hey, let's get high. But the costs soon became all too real. Back in November, I, um, I lost a very, very dear friend of mine oh. to an overdose. I think that, um, yeah, the pandemic had a lot to do with it, to be honest. The source of the fentanyl flooding America's streets might come as a surprise. According to data compiled by the Drug Enforcement Administration, illicit fentanyl is primarily manufactured in China and smuggled into the United States through Mexico. Some say this should constitute an act of war. Well, we should consider each of those deaths a murder yeah. because China wanted Americans dead. China knows exactly what's going on. So when they sell fentanyl, you have to assume that this is Communist Party policy. These experts fear fentanyl may prove to be our adversary's most powerful weapon, defeating America from the inside out. Every time someone says fentanyl, we should be saying China. Unfortunately, that's not the case. If our enemies can destroy our youth who fight our wars, then they've already won the battle. From Southern West Virginia, I'm Chuck Holton for CBN News. Now, the op opioid epidemic, and it is an epidemic, is a national tragedy. You look back at the history of it and, you know, how people got hooked on these things. There were uh, this uh, overdose of prescriptions, if you will, 
But now we're into yet another phase of it, and China is absolutely fueling it. And they know the fentanyl manufacturers. Uh, it's not some surprise to them. At various points in time, the U.S. government has objected, and China has given lip service to cracking down on it, but still there's a flood of fentanyl into our country. And it's remarkably cheap to manufacture, and that's why the drug traffickers are, are, are using it. From the Chinese point of view, they think this is payback. And you go back in history to the opium wars, and, and we, we conveniently forget those, but the British East India Company uh, went to war against China twice, not just once, twice, to make sure that their country was op open to opium imports. The opium came out of India, uh, and then they distributed it through China, and it caused a national tragedy of addiction. Uh, you go back and, and look through Chinese history, you see the horrible photographs, the destroyed families, uh, they have a very personal experience with addiction, and they know uh, what the devastating consequences are. So is this payback? I think you can say yes, and we need to re realize what's happening. Uh, there's another opium war happening, and it's happening right here in the United States. In other news, no one is calling inflation transitory anymore. Americans want to know what Washington will do about it. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? That's right, Gordon. Inflation has hit its highest level in 40 years, leading politicians, economists, and most of all consumers looking to the Federal Reserve to put an end to it. As CBN's Brady Carter explains, for now, those higher prices are hurting Americans in their pocketbooks. Once again, the latest inflation numbers were higher than expected, showing that the problem of rising prices is still far from over. We have uh, inflation and we have basically uh, an economy that's on fire. Consumer costs rising the most in 40 years, climbing 7.5% over the last year. Two of the most important categories saw the biggest increases at the pump, with gas up 40%. And at the grocery store, food prices also rising sharply, with some items going up by double digits. I haven't driven a car in three years, but friends of mine call me that tell me they don't want to come into the city no more because the, the gas prices are through the roof. And although wages have gone up, prices have climbed even more. That meant real wages actually fell by 1.7% last year. The president acknowledging the problem, using the latest numbers to once again try and sell his spending plans. Inflation is up. It's up. And coming from a family when the price of gas went up, you felt it in the household. You knew what it was like. It matters. But the fact is that if we are able to do the things I'm talking about here, it'll bring down the cost for average families. But critics say Democratic spending last year made inflation worse, and many in Congress are arguing spending even more. This is not a time to be throwing more fuel on the fire. We have, an infl we have uh, inflation, and we have basically uh, an economy that's on fire. You don't throw more fuel on the fire that's already on fire, causing the problems that we have. Now the hope is that the Federal Reserve's plans to raise interest rates will bring down inflation. But those rate hikes could also weaken the economy. And it may take quite some time before they finally slow the rapid rise in prices. Brody Carter, CBN News. Thank you, Brody. Turning now overseas to the Middle East. Just days ago, CBN News reported on backlash caused by an Amnesty International report accusing Israel of being an apartheid state. As Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem, one result of the fallout shines the light on a major issue basically ignored by the group whose mission is to end abuses of human rights. The Amnesty International report concluded that Israel's cruel policies of segregation, dispossession and exclusion across all territories under its control clearly amount to apartheid. Amnesty International said they use the international definition of apartheid. Apartheid most commonly refers to a South African policy of separating blacks and whites, which existed for more than 40 years. It ended in the mid-1990s. Amnesty and the UN, which is going to be joining the effort, by describing Israel as an apartheid state, isn't it getting it wrong? 
They're getting the opposite of the truth. Professor Eugene Kontorovich explains his conclusion in a piece published by the Wall Street Journal titled, There's Apartheid in the Holy Land, but not in Israel. Israel is a country where Arabs participate in all walks of public life, hold positions in the government. In Israel, Arabs and Jews mingle in cafes, on buses, in all public places. But right next door, in those areas of the Holy Land governed by the Palestinian Authority, real apartheid is practiced. Kontorovich points out the PA has a law that calls for the death penalty if a Palestinian sells land to a Jew. Back in November, CBN News asked the Palestinian Authority's prime minister about that law. Land in Palestine is not a real estate issue. Land in Palestine is a political issue. So therefore, the Palestinian law does not allow land to be sold to non-Palestinians. Another controversial Palestinian government policy is referred to as pay to slay. That program rewards terrorists convicted of killing Jews. The U.S. Congress passed a law called the Taylor Force Act, preventing the U.S. from funding this policy. It's named after an American, Taylor Force, who was killed by a Palestinian in a terror attack. Israel is not sponsoring a program of pay for slay against Palestinians, whereas the Palestinian government, supported by Western governments, funds a pay for slay program to pay for the murder of Jews. Kontorovich says through all its laws and policies, the PA has created a Jew-free zone. When you look at the areas controlled by the Palestinian Authority, it's not that there's no separation of Jews and Arabs, there's just no Jews, because they have created a Jew-free state, and they enforce this through official methods. Despite these policies, it's a situation seldom reported on by Amnesty International, the UN, and other human rights groups. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. All right, thank you, Chris. Gordon, back to you. Well, it's about time we start calling it for what it is, and it is extreme racism. The anti-Semitism that comes out of the Palestinian people. It's not just the Palestinian Authority, but the Palestinian people. Uh, there, there are Palestinian neighborhoods where if you're Jewish, you cannot possibly walk there. You can't go there without fear for your life. There have been incidences where people have been dragged from their cars and beaten to near death. Uh, if you sell, if you're a Palestinian and you sell land to a Jewish person, they will execute you. And it's not some vigilante doing it. The government will do it. They will sentence you to death. Uh, let's start calling it for what it is. This whole boycott, div divestment, sanction thing that's happening against Israel right now it's complete doublespeak as to what's really going on in Gaza, in the West Bank, and in Ramallah. They put up statues and they name streets after terrorists and after bombers. They pay people to kill Jews. These, these are incredible things. And let's all as a world wake up to it. And above everything, let's stop funding it. Terry? Well, up next, the civil war within the GOP. Republicans are name-calling their fellow conservatives and their blackballing members who are speaking out against Donald Trump. See how the former president has split the Republican Party after this. Plus, a journalist goes searching for her ancestors and traces her lineage all the way back to the slave quarters of Monticello. Hear how she's shedding light on a long hidden side of American history. Well, let's go back a few years ago and Donald Trump entering politics, becoming a lightning rod and against all odds, winning the Republican nomination for the office of president. Well, today, the former president remains a contentious figure in the party, as well as a major player. David Brody brings us this look at factions inside the GOP and the possible impact on the future. The days of Ronald Reagan seem long gone in today's Republican Party. The iconic Republican president was fond of saying that the person who agrees with you 80 percent of the time is a friend and an ally not a 20% traitor. Well, that's certainly not the case today within the GOP. The 2020 election changed everything. Mitch McConnell didn't have the courage to challenge the election. 
And with that, dividing lines were drawn, with Republicans like Congresswoman Liz Cheney on one side. We must speak the truth. Our election was not stolen. And Senate candidates like Ohio's Josh Mandel on the other. I believe this election was stolen from Donald J. Trump. Mandel and many others believe that is the winning stance in today's GOP. There's only one candidate in this race for U.S. Senate who's willing to say that the election was stolen from Donald J. Trump. And I'm willing to say that because it's the truth. And I have guts and backbone and a steel spine. And I don't care if the liberal media attacks me. Mandel seems to have strong backing on that side of the GOP. Current polls show 57 percent of Republicans saying they will not vote for any GOP candidate who agrees that Joe Biden won the election fair and square. And then there's January 6th. Recently, Trump said if he runs and regains the presidency, he'd look at pardoning those convicted of crimes at the U.S. Capitol that day. Republican Lindsey Graham strongly disagrees. I think it's inappropriate. I, I don't want to reinforce that defiling the Capitol was OK. Trump fired back. Well, Lindsey Graham's wrong. I mean, Lindsey's a nice guy, but he's a rhino. And so that's where we are in today's GOP. Republican congressmen who have been reliable conservative votes over the years are now called rhinos. Republicans in name only. The label has been bestowed on U.S. Senator Mitt Romney and others who joined Democrats to pass the $1 trillion infrastructure bill. I asked Republican National Committee Chairwoman Ronna McDowell about the name calling in a recent interview. So how, how do you kind of define rhino? I feel like that's changed over the years. Do you think that definition has changed in recent years? It seems like uh, well, know, who was a rhino I'm years ago. Into, might... I'm not as into dividing right now because we need everyone to go in against the Democrats. And I know everybody focuses on inner party stuff and that'll work out in the primaries. The RNC has to stay neutral in primaries. Yet the RNC clearly recognizes where the momentum and energy is right now in the Republican Party. And that's why there is a proposal to remove Republicans Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger from the House Republican Conference due to their vocal support of the January 6th committee. The big mo, as in money, is also squarely with Donald Trump. His political operation starts the year with $122 million in the bank, much of it from small donations. It appears his post-election rhetoric has made him stronger. Some candidates running in the midterms credit Trump for changing the GOP message. It's become more of a populist party. It's no longer kind of like your grandfather's Republican Party. And thank God. You know, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the generations before us took pride in voting for conservatives, took pride in voting for Republicans. But they were getting the wool pulled over their eyes in Washington and people <sighs> were just voting down the line for people that essentially sold them up the river, mm. moderate Republicans that would vote with the Chamber of Commerce and totally abandon some of our, uh, some of what we find as core morals and ethics. Even President Biden understands Trump's gravitational pull, which he believes has prevented him from getting Republican support. Did you ever think that one man out of office could intimidate an entire party where they're unwilling to take any vote contrary to what he thinks should be taken for fear of being defeated in a primary. I've had five Republican senators talk to me, bump into me, quote unquote, or sit with me, who've told me that they agree with whatever I'm talking about for them to do. But Joe, if I do it, I'm going to defeat it in a primary. I discussed the state of the GOP with Pennsylvania congressional candidate Kathy Barnett. How do you see the Republican Party? Is, is Trump kind of a litmus test for Republicans today? You know, I mean, some say they are. But listen, we have, you know, I mean, you, you know, D.C. is a swamp. And in every swamp, you have alligators. And you have some alligators that are on a rock, sunbathing. And then you have other alligators that are right up on you. Democrats are the alligators that are right up on us. We need to be real focused, real clear. Don't focus on the alligator on the on the on the rock sunbathing. Focus on the alligator that is right up on us and is about to destroy our country. There's no doubt something is in the water that's led to a shift in the Republican current. The question remains whether it will lead to the much talked about wave that could retake the majority in November. David Brody, CBN News, Washington. I used to be a lot more involved in politics than I am today. And back in the late 1980s, early 1990s, 
Uh, if we were coming up on an election and the party was busy um, having internal disputes and getting mad at one another and trying to have litmus tests and all these other kinds of things, it was pretty much a sign that you weren't going to win the election uh, because you couldn't unify and you couldn't get behind the candidates who were actually standing for election. Uh, I'm seeing that repeat out on a very large stage right now and a lot of focus on January 6th, a lot of focus on an election that has been decided, whether you agree with the decision or not. The Electoral College, the votes were certified by the states, uh, and then as it's the duty of the vice president and the Senate to count those, those votes were counted, and a new president was put in office. It's time to move on. And if you focus all the attention on that and you have to have some kind of litmus test or pledge of loyalty or I agree with your version of events, well, then you're not going to move on and you're not going to focus on the important thing. The country is the important thing. Uh, the politics, the party, individual candidates, please, can we come together and say as a country, we're facing enormous problems whether it's Ukraine, whether it's China, whether it's the rise of India, whether it's the rise of Iran, all of these things uh, are deeply concerning and should be to every single American. The rise in inflation right here at home. If we're spending all our time trying to worry about this other stuff, things that you can't change, it's not going to make a difference. Focus on what makes a difference and can we come together I'll say it again, a house divided cannot stand if we don't realize that and come together and say, how can we have agreement? What should we do about the pressing problems facing us? Let's come to consensus for that. Well, then there's hope for America. If we spend all our time fighting among, among each other, well, then again, a house divided can't stand. Terry? Pray for righteous leaders. Amen. Yeah. Well, still ahead, death on the softball field. A player has a heart attack during a game. See how he was brought back to life. That's coming up. Plus, her favorite president was Thomas Jefferson, and that was before she found out she was related to him. Find out what she did when she discovered her family's secret. That's next. Last November, a statue of Thomas Jefferson was removed from New York City's New York City Hall. City officials had unanimously demanded it be taken down because of Jefferson's history as a slave owner. Gail Jessup White knows that the third president has a complicated and in some cases a regrettable legacy. Gail works at Jefferson's Monticello home. Her ancestors were slaves there, and she is a direct descendant of Jefferson himself. For Gail Jessup White, landing the job of public relations and community engagement officer at Thomas Jefferson's historic home, Monticello, was more than a chance to share her passion for American history. It was the result of a lifelong search for the truth about who she was and America's third president. It started when she was a young girl, growing up in 1970s Washington, D.C. At the time, Jefferson was my favorite president because he'd written the Declaration. And I believed, and still believe, in the principles put forth in that document. She was 13 when her sister shared a bit of family lore regarding the main author of the Declaration of Independence. They were related. Well, I was shocked. And I went to my dad first. Daddy, how could we be descended from Thomas Jefferson? This doesn't make sense to me. All Daddy said to me was, that's what they say. For years, Gail would dream of one day finding out if what they said was true. I always felt that if I could determine my ties to Jefferson, I could find out more about my family. We are the sum total of our backgrounds, of our ancestors, and I didn't know who mine were. I needed to know that to feel whole. In the 90s, when Gail was out of college and building a career in journalism, she got serious about her search but finding records of enslaved people from the 1700s wouldn't be so easy. The biggest clues came from stories passed down through her father and his family. 
oral history matters because for many black people, that's all we have. We're treated as possessions. They were possessions. So you might find information about them on tax records or in wills, but you won't find them in the census record for the most part until 1870. As Gail followed her own leads, DNA research confirmed the long-told rumor that Jefferson had children with an enslaved woman named Sally Hemings. For many years, I assumed I was descended from Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. Little pieces were coming together, but not enough for me to understand how we could have been descended. There was just enough information out there to keep me aware of the possibility. Gail would spend years following clues, tracing her family tree, and scouring historical records. Then, in 2010, while with her son on one of many visits to Monticello, we go on the tour and the guide says, Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson had children together. And I raised my hand as I always did. And we're descended from Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson. And the guide says, well, your dignitary is your family. Unlike previous guides, this one took an interest in Gail's story and connected her with Monticello historian, Cinder Stanton. With Cinder's help, Gail's four decades of research would soon culminate. Thomas Jefferson was her five times great-grandfather, and Sally Hemings, her four times great-aunt. I'm actually descended from her brother, Peter Hemings, who was a cook at Monticello. The kitchen where Peter worked came to be one of Gail's favorite rooms at Monticello. When I'm in that space where I feel the presence of my ancestors, that's sacred ground for me. In 2014, Gail was selected for the fellowship program at the International Center for Jefferson Studies. Her discoveries there opened a window into who her ancestors were, overcomers who helped build America while being oppressed by slavery. I'm proud of my relatives who were enslaved because they were up against so much. They survived. They were strong, they were tough. They were able to pass down character, dignity, strength, humanity, love, joy, pain, resilience to their descendants. That's why I'm here, because of them. If we are going to heal as a country, then we have to be honest about our complicated history. And it is very complicated and it's very painful. It was in 2016 that Gail came on staff at Monticello educating the public about the legacy, the good and the bad, of one of America's founding fathers. I recognize Jefferson now as being a human being who made some horrible decisions, sinful decisions, only people are sinful. On the other hand, he gave us those soaring words that I meant to say all humans are created equal that have served as inspiration for hundreds of years now for people to fight for their freedom and liberty and justice for all. So Jefferson represents the full complexity of this country and how it was founded. In her book, Reclamation, Gail chronicles her journey to find her heritage and more. It serves as a metaphor, not just for my family, but for black families in America, to understand and for all people to acknowledge that our ancestors helped build this country. I found not just the history, but I found my family. And I've made those connections. And I have found my wholeness. A wholeness she hopes all Americans will soon share. We are one people. We have more in common than not. It's important to look at each other and to work through those differences and see ourselves as Americans and recognize the kinship. It's an American story. It's all of our American story. You can learn more about this important story in American history by getting Gail's book. It's called Reclamation, Sally Hemings, Thomas Jefferson, and a Descendant's Search for Her Family's Lasting Legacy. Fascinating story, fascinating book. It's available nationwide. Gordon? Well, up next, a sudden collapse. A man falls face first on the ground. He wasn't breathing and he had no pulse. Find out what saved his life. Plus, we'll be praying for you right after this.
Welcome back to Washington for the CBN Newsbreak. India plans to launch a digital version of its currency, the rupee. Making the announcement last week, the country's finance minister said the move would strengthen the country's digital economy. Details of the government's plan still have to be worked out, and there are concerns about online privacy under the new system. Other countries are also investigating using digital currencies, including the United States. Well, CBN's Operation Blessing is providing medicine and health care to those in need around the world. Getting prenatal care for expectant mothers in Kenya can require long journeys, and often families in rural communities can't afford the trip, leaving some mothers in jeopardy of losing their children to a preventable illness or curable disease, or perhaps even in childbirth. Jacqueline was pregnant with her fourth baby, and Leah already had five kids. Operation Blessings partners provided funding for a community health volunteer program for their rural, rural village, training local volunteers in basic health care information and practices. Those volunteers do home visits and help local families. Because of the program, Leah gave birth to a healthy baby boy, and Jacqueline is carrying her child with joy and peace. You can find out more about Operation Blessing by visiting ob.org. Gordon and Terry will be back with more Today's 700 Club right after this. Ken Davis had a widowmaker heart attack during a softball game. He was unresponsive, covered in blood. At first, you know, the first responders, they rushed to the scene. Ken's wife helped to save his life, even though she was 900 miles away. It was the bottom of the eighth in the over 50 softball league semifinal championship game. Ken Davis hit a line drive to left field that he thought he could stretch into an inside the park home run. He was running from third to home and there was a play at home and he, he ended up getting thrown out. He was walking over to the dugout and he got to this spot right here and he fell. Ken, who had always been the picture of health, now lay motionless as people sprang into action. And they rolled him over. He had scratches here and scratches on his face. So we thought he busted his nose, actually, because there was blood all around his mouth. When they realized he was unresponsive, two of the players, a retired firefighter and retired EMT, started CPR. I turned to a buddy of mine, Rick Harder, and I said, we just need to pray. We need to pray. Two calls went out, one to 911, the other to Ken's wife, Vicki, who was in Tennessee visiting family. Not recognizing the number, she let it go to voicemail. But moments later, something told her she should check it. The voicemail said, hi, this is Jean Smith. I am with the softball league, and it appears that your husband is having some issues. It appears to be his heart. I'm so very sorry. 911 has been called, and the ambulance is on their way. Although 900 miles away, Vicki and her family did what they could. We just prayed, asked the Lord, to keep him safe. I have a choice right now. I have a choice to believe it, or I have a choice to worry. And I'm gonna make a choice right now to believe that he is okay. We've asked God the Father. And so when I verbally made that conscious decision to say, I am gonna believe God, I immediately felt peaceful. Meanwhile, first responders of the Brevard County Fire Rescue were en route. Based on the initial report, they felt there was little reason for anyone to hold on to hope. He, he had died at that point, and there was resuscitation attempts being performed. Typically, when we go to a, a CPR in progress or cardiac arrest, again, the outcome's typically not good. Back at the field, over 10 minutes had passed. Despite the heroic efforts, Ken still wasn't responding. And I was just praying whatever the Holy Spirit put on my heart to pray and just was lifting up everybody that was working on him and just was praying at the, the EMTs and the fire department, whoever would get here quick. Then someone arrived with an AED machine they found on the other side of the complex. They quickly hooked Ken up and shocked his heart. They got a pulse. Moments later, the firefighter EMTs arrived as Ken was just coming to. He was responding when we got there on scene and he had stable vital signs at that time. We started IVs. Uh, we started cardiac monitoring. We didn't want him to go back into the, the arrhythmia um, that had caused him to be, become unresponsive. It is unusual to have a patient that had a cardiac event and to have them, you know, completely conscious. They quickly stabilized Ken and sent him in an ambulance to the nearest hospital. 
After a barrage of tests, doctors still weren't sure what was wrong and scheduled an exploratory surgery for the next day. Finally, Ken was able to call Vicki. It was a great relief to hear his voice, to know at least that he was conscious. Of course, I was crying and he was emotional. I told her I was fine and um, I told her I loved her and she loved me. Vicki caught an early flight the next day, arriving at the hospital just minutes before Ken went in for surgery. Immediately walked in the room and gave him a big hug. Saw him there, of course, he had tubes all over and his face was a wreck. That is when it really hit me. Like, wow, this was truly, truly a miracle. In surgery, Ken's cardiologist discovered the problem, a 90% blockage in his left main artery, also known as the Widowmaker. Two stints restored blood flow. It's a very, very rare thing when somebody survives it. And he at that moment said, you are lucky to be alive. You are a miracle. This was a God thing. He had everybody orchestrated here to be able to do the work to save this man's life. I really believe that this was a miracle. Um, I mean, there was no way that without the actions of the people on the field, the experience they had, and the miracle of just having all those guys there that night praying. There were just so many miracles all around. I'm just thankful that, <laughs> that those miracles were in place. As I look back on the incident, I completely see God in every step of the way. Ken was put on medications and released a few days later. He still enjoys an active life and is quick to share God's miraculous power whenever he can. God is always in control. He's going to work through people and he's going to put the people in the right place. There's a purpose for, for, for us being here. There's a purpose for me being here now. You just can't take life for granted. There's always something that's going to happen, and God's in control. God is in control. I love what Ken says. I'm glad that those miracles were available to me that day. Those miracles are available to you today. And the reason I can say that with such confidence is that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he is, what he accomplished, is always available to you. How do you enter into it? Well, you believe it. Believe it. Look to the cross. Look to what he accomplished. And then look beyond the cross. Look to the resurrection. When you realize that same resurrection power, I'm quoting the Bible, that same resurrection power is in you, well then, yeah. You can come back from a widowmaker. You can come back from whatever you are going through right now. He will be your very present help in time of need. Now, Terry and I are going to pray. Before we pray, we've got some encouraging words for you. Here's Sue from Ironwood, Michigan. She had a chronic cough when she was 55 years old. She's had it for eight years. She's now 63. Well, during the 700 Club, Sue heard Terry pray for someone with difficulty swallowing. Terry said, you have a very bad cough. It's not the coronavirus, it's a chronic condition. Well, Sue believed, and after eight and a half years, she is completely healed. That is wonderful. Well, this is Antoinette. She lives in Bird's Nest, Virginia. Suffered with severe arthritis in her left knee. It started 15 years ago. While watching this program, Gordon, she heard you say, you are laying your hand on your left knee. All of that pain is draining away. What you couldn't do before, do now, and receive healing throughout that joint. As Antoinette placed her hand on her knee, the pain disappeared. She called the 700 Club rejoicing in her complete healing. Praise the Lord. All right. Well, let's rejoice in your complete healing. How do you get it? Well, you just ask for it. Mm. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what Jesus told his disciples to proclaim, that the kingdom of heaven has drawn near to you. It's right there. All you have to do is reach up and grab it. Now, in heaven, is there anybody sick? Is there anybody with arthritis? Anyone with chronic pain? Well, no. All of that is illegal in heaven. Let's pray 
for God's will to be done in your body as it is in heaven. Let's proclaim that the dominion of God, the kingdom of God, has drawn near to you. And let's do it right now. Lord, we just believe. We believe in the cross. We believe in your sacrifice. We believe in your resurrection. We believe that right now, you're at the right hand of the Father and you're praying for us. You're interceding for us. May your prayers over us be answered. We say yes and amen to your will. And your will is there would be no disease, there would be no pain, there would be no tear. So we receive your will now. May it be done in our bodies as you desire in heaven. We receive your will. We claim it now in Jesus' name. Terry, God's given you something. There's someone, you have a problem with your immune system, and I don't even know what this is called, but your tongue has keeps breaking out with these actual like ulcers on the top and the bottom. So every time you talk or try to eat anything, it's like sandpaper on, on that. God's healing that for you. Those things are going to dry up, heal up, and you'll not have another one again. Uh, your name is Angela, and you're, you're crying out for, for, for pain. I believe it's neuropathy. Uh, God is healing you from that. He's healing you from even the diabetic condition that has created it. He's able to do a complete makeover to your body right now. Just receive it in Jesus' name. There's someone else who have Bell's palsy pain on the right side of your face, uh, partial paralysis, but the lingering nerve pain is just awesome, uh, awful for you. God is, is just doing a wonderful miracle throughout that nerve all those connections, you're going to get restoration of movement. All of that uh, paralysis is leaving your face right now. The nerve is being restored. Just receive it in Jesus' name. This is kind of unusual. Um, there's somebody you're watching. You have an issue with doubt. It's really strange because you want to believe, but so many things have happened to you. You're, you're just not able to jump over that. Well, God is giving you the gift of faith today. It's not something you can earn. It's not something you have to do. You can't achieve it. We can't give it to you. It's yours today. Just lift up your hands and say, okay, God, I take it and believe and then get close to him. Uh, I think there are many people you have, you're suffering with, with depression and it's like a cloud over you. You, you. you want the joy of your salvation back. You want the joy of life back. Uh, Jesus is coming to you. He's able to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. Just receive that from him. Let, let your attention be drawn to him and not to the circumstances surrounding you. Look to him and receive his joy, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Receive it now in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. If you've been touched, let us know. I want to share your good report. Give us a call. 1-800-700-7000. And we're here for you. If you need prayer, we want to pray for you. And we're available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call. 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, we're going to be right back to answer some of your email questions. So don't go away. Back in a moment. Nikki and Andy are former addicts. They both managed to clean up their lives and thanks to help from Operation Blessing, they were able to get a new start as well. Take a look. Nikki and Andy are good parents who work and volunteer at their church, but their lives weren't always like this. Before they met, Nikki and Andy battled drug addiction. Doing heroin is almost like getting as close to death as you possibly can without dying. Everything was about getting the next fix and there was nothing else. There was nothing outside of that. I lost everything to the point where I was homeless. I had a good career, I had a home, I had cars, I had a wife, I had kids, and I was down to nothing. They both enrolled in Faith Home, a rehabilitation program run by Lighthouse Gospel Mission, which partners with Operation Blessing. While they were there, they found Jesus. 
After they graduated, they found each other. Sometimes I have to pinch myself to be married to a man of God, be raising up these two beautiful children in the kingdom of God. I never thought that it was possible. It was purely by the power of Jesus Christ. Throughout their recovery journey, they relied on help from their church. We had nothing. We were barely making any money. We could barely survive. We could barely even feed ourselves. If it wasn't for that food that we were getting from the ministry, from Operation Blessing, we wouldn't have had anything to eat. I'll never forget coming into the faith home and the food that they would give us. I mean, it was just like we were eating like kings and queens. The food that we got and the food that we would bring home and the way that we were able to eat healthy and cook healthy meals, honestly, I don't see how we would have made it without the blessing of food from Operation Blessing. Today, they both work full-time at the church and even volunteer there on their personal time. Nikki leads worship while Andy runs security to make sure church families are safe. We lack nothing. We want for nothing. We have a full fridge every week. Our bills are paid on time every month, which for me is huge, you know, because that never used to happen. Thank you to everybody who gives into Operation Blessing. It means so much. It's so much more than filling bellies. Like, it's really filling hearts. You know, you and I are born to be relational with people. And I love watching Nikki and Andy's story because I see that when I'm a part of the 700 Club, I am a part of other people's lives. I'm a part of supporting them in the good times, supporting them in the bad times, praying for things that people need. We all need to link together. You know, God promises that when we're unified, He commands a blessing. We want you to be a part of the blessing by saying, yes, I want to speak into the needs and the lives of other people. You can do that by joining the 700 Club. It's 65 cents a day, $20 a month. This was the story of a family here in America who had a need. But when you join the 700 Club, you are touching thousands and thousands of families every day all around the world from the comfort of your living room. Will you join now? Our number's toll free. It's 1-800-700-7000. Just call. Say, I want to join the 700 Club. Here are your level options. I want to show you what you have to choose from. General membership is the top line, $20 a month. That's 65 cents a day. You could join 700 Club Gold at $40 a month or become a 1,000 Club member at $84 a month. Be a 2,500 Club member. That's $209 a month. Or Founders, they join us at $5,000 a year. That works out to $417 a month. Ask God what he'd have you to do and then Call, call with anticipation, knowing you're about to make a difference in the lives of all kinds of people. When you join the 700 Club, our way of saying thank you for caring about others is to send you Pat's latest book. I think you're going to love it. It's called The Power of the Holy Spirit in You. Understanding the miraculous power of God, the Holy Spirit, the spirit that Jesus said, don't leave this upper room until the comforter comes to you. That's the Holy Spirit. We all need to have them in our lives. This will tell you about Pat's experience and teach you how to get a hold of that power for yourself. So 1-800-700-7000. Just call and say, I want to join the 700 Club. Time for some email. You ready? All right. I am. Keisha asks, how do I receive healing and how do I know that I will be healed? Well, Keisha, I could talk for hours about that topic. Yes, really. uh, I, there's a, a wonderful book by F.F. F. Bosworth, Healing by Christ, that, it, you know, it's 100 years old. Um, but if you really want a deep dive into theology of healing, that's one. The, in, in my prayer time just this morning, um, I was meditating on the words, your faith has made you whole. How do you get healing? Your faith has made you whole. This is what Jesus would say to people literally as he's touching them. So he's not saying, I'm making you healed, even though that's the, the reality of it. But it's, it's able to happen because our faith allows his healing power in. When you have that picture that it's his will to heal, it's his will to save, it's his will to love you. He loves you infinitely. He died for you. That is, that is present fact, present truth. You, you can receive that. It's that belief that allows all of that healing power to come into you. 
if you're stuck in, have I prayed enough? Have I bargained enough? Have I done enough good deeds? Have I done all these things? You're off of Jesus, and I would encourage you, your faith has made you whole. Do we have time for one more? I don't think so. Right. I think we're, we've run out of time. We're out of time, time, time and, they've, and... <laughs> they've, the prompter has left us, and we have no more support. What, what do you think, what, what's, from your standpoint, what, what's the key to miracles? I think believing, but believing is sometimes, you know, if you feel any doubt at all, you think, oh my gosh, now I'm out of the, out of the line. I'm, I can't receive. But, you know, he says no, the, you're not out the of grain, line. the you know, faith mustard like seeds. mustard seed. You're not yes. out of the line. You're never out of the line. Don't let your doubts sort of overwhelm that he loves you. Yes. And it's his will to heal you. Here's a word from Job. He performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be counted. God bless. We'll see you again.